to introduce Derek. He's uh, done his bachelor in physics at Caltech and then his master's and PhD at Stanford at Yelena's group. This was followed by a postdoctoral position at Harvard, after which he joined uh, Columbia as an assistant professor. And then in 2013, I believe, at MIT to start his research group. So um, today he's going to be talking about uh, machine learning with in physics computing. Derek? Thank you so much for the introduction. Well, this thing really works. This is not like a. No. <laughs> this is actually device. Okay, that's something. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's working. Thank you. Wow, it's so great to see so many familiar faces. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so, yes, so since this is the Joint Quantum Institute, I actually decided to add a couple of slides on some of the other stuff we do before I launch into this new topic. Uh, but I hope that the new topic, which will in fact be the machine learning, uh, will be of interest to you. It's a bit, uh, it's not like your common dietary uh, uh, fare, uh, but I thought maybe it'd be interesting. And so I think there's some, a lot of interesting connections between um, the needs of, of uh, the computing community um, for especially now machine learning and other kinds of systems that are in some way analog and uh, the physics community. Uh, so the physicists are once, a called, once again uh, called upon to help solve uh, real problems in computing. And I, I believe at least, and I think that's an exciting time. Uh, but let me give you sort of like just uh, people who don't know our work, a couple of slides of what we do for the other half of the time. Uh, so um, <clears throat> shown here is a map of the different or some of the different uh, physical systems that are being developed for, um, for, for quantum information science and engineering applications. Uh, um, and in particular here towards the area of quantum computing where uh, there's a lot of interest in building uh, many body systems, many body quantum systems where each particle is uh, programmable individually. And uh, so I've, I've kind of represented the state of the field here by, by two axes. One is the non-classical system size, like how many quantum particles, electron spins, nuclear spins, photons, or whatever, can be put into a non-classical quantum state that has entanglement shared across all particles, for example. And so what you see here on the high side is perhaps electrons in that participate in uh, uh, many body uh, electron physics in 2D materials, or there's a lot of work in that some of the people here involved in it as well on um, on spins in solids uh, with dipolar coupling uh, that uh, um, uh, that that are large in system size, but that are not presently individually programmable. So you might have 100 electron spins that are coupled uh, by dipolar interactions, but they're not individually addressable. Um, ultra cold atoms. Uh, ultra cold atom microscopes are another example where many, many, just many, many particles can be entangled but not individually controlled. Whereas um, over here, for example, single photons can be uh, generated and uh, manipulated with high precision, for example, using polarization, degree of freedom, or so. But the interaction between photons is not sufficiently strong to make many body. Uh, 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 systems with high probability. So the non-classical system size is small, but the programmability is high. Um, and so uh, these different systems here, there's a, there's a lot of uh, pull to get them into the upper right-hand corner of uh, realizing large and complex or programmable uh, quantum systems. Um, then maybe things like quantum chemistry become not only possible, but actually useful. Uh, in such simulators, and uh, so a big, the the sort of the big other topic in my group is to see if we can connect different modalities into hybrid systems. For example, optical photons connected to electron spins and nuclear spins in solids, so that we can reap the sort of beneficial aspects of both. One, the photons 
although they're fickle, they they don't go very far or they're not, but they um, because of losses, but they can transport quantum information from point to point. And so that's the idea of uh, hybrid quantum systems. And, and a really exciting uh, but tough uh, challenge there is to build interfaces. Uh, for example, the spin photon interfaces via electronic transitions and, and atomic systems that allow us to connect coherently quantum information stored in spins with quantum information stored in some property of the optical field, like polarization, like a single mode excitation of a polarization or so. Or there's a lot of work uh, even at the JQI on making phononic systems that couple uh, photons to uh, acoustic modes. And once you are in an acoustic mode, turns out you can actually couple quite strongly uh, and literally from a physics perspective, from a physics sense, strong coupling to, um, to uh, spins. And so these interfaces are a big challenge in the field, um, but it's something that if we can overcome it, you could you you, you would you would uh, derive much benefit from it, and so in particular in in uh, for in my group we 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 do a great amount of work in making um, spin photon interfaces based on color centers. Uh, here shown are are uh, nitrogen vacancy color centers in diamond. I think most of you in the JQI will know them, but these are atom like they have atom like uh, properties. They have electronic transitions that are discrete and spin selective. So that uh, you can drive spin selective optical transitions, which allows you to uh, entangle an optical field uh, with the state of the spin. Uh, so these spin photon interfaces are one of these coherent interfaces between different modalities of storing and qu processing quantum information. If you apply, for example, two spin photon interfaces uh, transitions by driving, for example, two uh, nitrogen vacancy centers. Um, and then direct the optical fields at a beam splitter and perform uh, measurement uh, with single photon resolving detectors. You can uh, project, sometimes you get the right click pattern that projects uh, onto the electron spins being in an entangled state. That entangled state can then, uh, you can use it for different things as it becomes a resource for different applications. Perhaps you can like, people have shown that you can teleport the quantum information previously prepared and a nuclear spin indicated here as gray, uh, you can teleport that via these this resource of uh, bell pairs in electron spins from one place to another with high fidelity and um, high probability. So people have used that, for example, to close one of the loopholes, the um, detection loophole in bell inequality tests. So um, this is uh, there's a lot of interest, therefore, to make these systems uh, larger and uh, and that sort of brings about the whole area of the quantum internet. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could connect all of, our, all of our different quantum devices, quantum computers, but perhaps also sensors and other systems together. And so uh, a lot, lot of the work in my group is, is on building this kind of a quantum uh, internet of things, um, which uh, for which we have some um, architectural models that could bring together different kinds of modalities, like like we saw on the first slide, superconductors, uh, perhaps um, color centers, uh, trapped ions, and and so forth. And, and so indeed, actually, the quantum network. Uh, so we have a lot of we've been doing a lot of thinking about uh, how one can architect the backbone of the quantum network that includes, for example, frequency distribution. Many of the things that, that JQI and NIST are so uh, are excellent at. Um, so I'm I'm glad actually. The, Looking forward to the conversations later today um, that that touch on these things. You have to have very very good uh, ways of distributing uh, oscillate oscillators uh, across the network. All the clocks, which are these atomic quantum systems, have to be synchronized and so forth. So it's not easy, but um, uh, certainly technically uh, the technically feasible, uh, not but not an easy thing to do. Um, and so those are some of the things we think about there. Uh, just the last two slides, and then I get to the main main fair for today. Um, so something that's always bugged me, but in the in the field of making these uh, atom-like particles, atom-like systems in solids, is that uh, unlike in uh, free space atomic systems or trapped ions or something, in the solid uh, systems aren't alike, uh, and so there isn't like there's um, every quantum emitter is a bit different from another, and so when you report, for example, on experiments, 
um, and you show like, here's an experiment I did on this color center. Well, that color center isn't necessarily representative of all color centers because they're different. They're individually different because of the local mesoscopic physics surrounding it. Uh, so there may be a defect, another defect in the crystal that uh, produces some electric field noise. And that might be different from another system. Every system is a bit different from one another. And so, um, and so it's really, uh, I think the, it, it's been necessary for the field to mature uh, into better reporting um, and really statistically meaningful sample sizes uh, to look at some of these, uh, these uh, the protocols that people are developing so that you like, you know, not, you know the diversity of, of uh, experimentation that really uh, happens. And so we, we wanted to take that on. Um, so one way is to tell a PhD student uh, to repeat that one experiment uh, like a hundred times on another color center. And that, that didn't really work for me. I don't know why. Uh, but, uh, so, or, but, and then at the same time, luckily uh, students, these, uh, this next generation, this new generation of students, they're like, they don't want to do the same experiment a uh, hundred times, but they, they do uh, take to programming. So um, <laughs> if they do like programming or not. So actually the sort of the, uh, the, the way around it is to say, oh, we should let program a robot that will do that experiment a hundred times. And that like they're into, right? So, um, so, uh, so now we can get large data sets. So what, what's shown here is uh, these, uh, 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 so, so basically about five years ago, we were able to uh, sort of uh, start running uh, cryogenic experiments that would uh, repeat uh, these uh, kinds of experiments. For example, in particular here, spectroscopy and measurements of the electrons, electron spin photon interfaces. Um, uh, in uh, just tirelessly, these robots would work uh, for for weeks at a time. Uh, we call them lovingly a uh, robotic microscope or Romy, and then there's a cryogenic version, which is Chromy. So in this case, Chromy was <laughs> was working for several weeks to obtain data sets of. Um, uh, in this case, this only took a couple of days. About we get about a thousand uh, measurements. We can char characterize the quantum properties of, of about a thousand uh, color center systems per day, which normally would like for a graduate student, they might be like uh, one per day or something like this. Um, there are some other techniques we use. We use wide field imaging, and then so that like you do, you you apply your laser control fields on all of the atomic systems at the same time, and you can image them with cameras, much like what we will do in these uh, atomic mic, like in ultra cold atom microscopes. So here's, for example, a, a screenshot showing you the sample surface. This is diamond that's been implanted in this case, um, and that's been doped with silicon atoms. And by um, producing defects using various methods, like uh, implanting of some other uh, uh, atomic systems or electrons, you can create vacancies. And then and the other thing to create silicon vacancy color centers, in this case, not NVs, but silicon vacancy centers. And you have them all over the sample. And then you, 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 uh, you, you, we create these QR markers using microfabrication methods so that we can orient. Chromi can, has a map of the sample. It knows where it is. And so then it can like look at all of these bright spots. Each of these bright spots here is a single, in this case, silicon vacancy center. And then it can look at the spectral distribution, for example, shown here. This is the spectral distribution um, um, uh, against, uh, against spatial axis. Uh, and the thing that I wanna draw your attention to is that um, in doing this iterative process for roughly five years, we were able to feed back, give really good data to the group that we worked with on the growth of these samples at Lincoln Laboratory. And so, um, and then refine the system so that these color centers become more and more homogeneous. So really one color center is very similar to another. And you can see that now, this is, this, we just put this on the archive a couple of days ago. Uh, this is why I wanted to bring that, add that to the slides here. You can see that the inhomogeneous distribution of these emitters is on the order of 300 megahertz. And the homogeneous distribution of one, the, the homogeneous line width of one emitter is on the order of 120 or so megahertz. So um, this is, uh, so, so an atomic physics people will say, ah, oh, this is not maybe it's so special, like, uh, you know, it would be like, they're not exactly identical one to another, but it is, um, but they're getting there. So th this is uh, like orders of magnitude narrower distribution than we previously had. 
And so um, we really have like this, this, these atomic systems that are frozen in the, in the crystal lattice, where one is quite similar to another. Um, so what's the magic that makes sense? So what's the magic? Yeah. So, well, first of all, data. Data was a really important, systematic and good quantities of data were part of the magic. Um, then, uh, because that gives you a view of what you're doing, right? You, you, you weren't, you're not blind or you're not like looking at a single system. That was the most important thing. Based on that data, uh, our growers then, or the, our collaborators who grow these samples could uh, try different growth techniques and then we could tell them, oh, this worked better than something else. And, uh, and in particular here, uh, what helped is to have very low strain in the substrate onto which the diamond a diamond layer is grown. You grow diamond on top of other diamond. And uh, in this case, that diamond is doped with silicon atoms in the growth. And, uh, and because the sample substrate is, is very, has very low strain, uh, defect free. Is it done by me? Yeah, that's actually by a process called high temperature, high pressure. So these are synthetic diamond substrates, but uh, most diamonds are grown by chemical vapor deposition, which um, in which it's, it's an out of equilibrium process. And so uh, you can have like a defect and it will propagate and cause some strain locally, right? So you have these little spots where the, because of a defect was there, things don't, the atoms don't have the chance to rearrange to minimize the, um, the you know, the uh, overall, uh, dips free energy. So um, what, what you can do is take a sample like this and put it into high pressure, high temperature annealing, which sort of simulates the properties. It puts it in the right phase space, okay? Um, high pressure, high temperature, where diamond actually wants to be, that, that carbon wants to be in that form of diamond, actually. And in that case, in that thermodynamic, then thermodynamic uh, 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 Minim, you know, Gibbs free energy is, is, is minimized and things can uh, become homogeneous. That, that was, that's the substrate. And then we grow the other samples on top. You can also do it the other way. Like you can also first implant color centers and then do HPHD and we found the same results. But the thing was this uh, getting it into a uh, thermodynamically favored state uh, made, made the sample homogeneous. Yeah, so um, so that's just sort of like the, the snapshot from there. And then that we can now produce, you know, millions of nearly identical color centers. And so, and then on the engineering side, uh, there's, we're now putting these into these photonic integrated circuits. I see that this uh, thing doesn't, uh, my, okay, this, this uh, okay, the video doesn't, hey, let me see. All right. So um, <clears throat> uh, then in a collaboration with uh, MITRE Corporation and with Sandia National Lab, we've then made these photonic integrated circuits that serve as a, an optical uh, big pro programmable backbone. So basically the wiring of a chip, uh, of, a, of a computer chip is now done by optical waveguides carrying photons, uh, shuttling uh, photons between quantum memories that, are, that we now co-integrate. Based on these diamond samples, we co-integrate them into this photonic integrated circuit. Uh, so that's a big, uh, that's sort of like uh, the, the other big part of my research activity at, at MIT with collaborators. And in passing, I, I thought I should also mention that some of those photonic integrated circuits that we're developing for connecting color centers, we're also finding other exciting applications for. So here, this is a paper we just uh, put up uh, on the archive. This was uh, led by Professor Ido Wax. This group in particular, Uday, is in the audience here. So, so these. In this case, using, um, this is also with Kutsia Kabashi. So in this case, uh, we are um, using these photonic circuits to route uh, light uh, emitted by trapped ions. And so um, these photonic circuits have a, they, they give you a great number of degrees of freedom of control. Um, and again, that's the sort of as, this, as in the direction of making this whole system more programmable. Um, so if you want to make a system programmable, if you want to have 100 qubits, you need to have of the order of 100 times some multiplier of control channels. So the bigger the system, the greater the controls challenge becomes. Photonic integrated circuits are, um, and we also do custom electronic circuits with foundries like TSMC. Those kinds of methods are becoming uh, useful and perhaps required if you want to scale to very large programmable multibody 
quantum systems, just because the sheer number of channels that you need to control uh, becomes difficult to manage using traditional methods. And so um, it is that same direction of building uh, systems capable of, uh, of driving very many RF channels and very many optical challenge, ch channels. That kind, of, that kind of drive that's been sort of motivating much of my research over the last 12 years in my group and that's actually led to this topic that I actually want to talk about today. So this is the first sort of time that I actually talked about this to, to a physics audience, but I thought it, I thought it would be sort of like refreshing for you guys. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so so but now you have sort of like where this all came from. We wanted to make analog control happen over very large numbers of electronic and optical channels, and it turns out that if you're good at that, you may also become very good at uh, doing machine learning. Um, and uh, mostly here, I'll talk about classical side of this. Actually, in the end, there's a, there's, there seems to be a convergence between, uh, uh, between some of these uh, control methods for quantum devices and for classical devices. So um, whether you like it or not, you probably all know, <laughs> like it's un inescapable uh, how important machine learning applications uh, systems have become. And uh, and one of like when you look under the hood uh, of something like a like an image recognition uh, algorithm, um, there is a uh, there is typically some variant of this thing here. Uh, this being a deep neural network, what you have is an input layer that encodes, for example, an image. You want to see on that image is there a cat or a dog or something, and you uh, and you connect it to the output via some number of so-called hidden layers. Um, and each at each layer, you have a number of things. You have these weights, which encode how much you should weight an, a particular neuronal value, which is represented by these circles, how much you should weight that in um, going from one layer to the next layer. So for example, like here, the input value x1, which might be the value of some pixel on an image, is uh, broadcast to all of the neurons in the next layer. This is a fully connected layer in this case uh, but these connections here are not necessarily equally strong so all of that is encoded in a matrix and uh, and then here you take these weighted values of the previous layer and you sum them and this is called uh, what you have to do is multiply the weight value by the input layer value or the previous neuron value so this is a multiplication step and then you need to accumulate it because you need to accumulate over all these signals. This is why machine learning people always talk about multiply, accumulate, or MAC. And, and the question is, how long does it take you in time to do a MAC? Or how much energy do you expend per MAC? Uh, and uh, and that's really a, sort of the sort of the primitive of machine learning hardware implementations: is time, energy, latency, and and the primitive is. The multiply accumulate unit. Now this is a super small neural net, not useful, uh, but there's and, and I also in passing I should say there's many variants of this. So I put this here. There's a the uh, Asimov Institute has a nice compilation of different kinds of neural nets. But as you know, they're being used for all kinds of things. Oftentimes nowadays you have a feedback actually of the uh, the output. It, it it actually modifies the response. So biases it it modifies. Uh, the values of the weights themselves. This is in transformer networks that are used in things like natural language processing. Um, so GPT-3, for example, uses something that actually incorporates some amount of feedback on top of it. Okay, but but at the essence, the number one thing that's uh, slowing uh, the the number one computational demand for machine learning applications is the multiply accumulate process. Uh, so, so you can, and this is the connect, the connection to what I talked to you about before is that uh, these values here are quote unquote analog or they're many valued. Okay, think about it. What does analog really mean? Maybe it's a bit undefined, but what they are really is, uh, uh, are, uh, it's, a uh, it's, it's a many valued input. So for example, the grayscale of an image you might represent the grayscale and in, in, as uh, typically at the eight bits or so sufficient. So a lot of machine learning actually will compress things into some eight bits 
which is uh, 256 levels of, of grayscale, right? So, um, but you can see if we can represent that rather than using digital computing, if we can uh, represent that as a 256 level value on a physical hardware, then perhaps we can speed this process up, this multiply accumulate. And that's the, the thing I wanna get into today. Why is it, and so why is it so important? Um, because, because the neural network size is scaling uh, exponentially fast. What's shown here is uh, are the leading neural network models um, as you know, plotted in time, uh, sort of the, the resurgence of machine learning, like neural networks really was, and that field has been around for a long time, more than 50 years, but really it's like the resurgence happened uh, in this image recognition uh, competition that led to AlexNet. Uh, AlexNet had some tens, I think like 30 million values, okay? So that model parameters was 30 million model parameters. Uh, so the weight, so it needed to have like 30, roughly 30 megabytes was the whole program. The program is the neural net. The program is the weights, right? You don't have to write code in the traditional way. The program is the neural net values. And, and the program was about 30 megabyte encoding roughly 30 million values, each being roughly eight bits in size. Okay, that was back then, all right? Then people learned, ah, okay, cool. I can make this a little bit smaller, right? So Google Net, for example, can do the same thing that image uh, that AlexNet would do for image recognition, but it could do it in a compressed form. All right, so that's nice. But then bigger challenges have uh, called for bigger and bigger neural nets, and we don't see the end of it. There's no, basically now what's happening is Every time you make the neural net bigger, it gets better. And so um, now we are, I don't know if you, anybody here has played around with GPT, has anybody played with GPT-3? Have a conversation? Yeah, a couple, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, one of the employees from Google like was let go because he claimed that it was conscient, <laughs> sentient, I guess. Um, I don't know about that, but I actually reviewed the transcript, it's interesting. I wouldn't say that, but nonetheless, it's quite, it's becoming incredibly good, okay? And th those, and GPT-3, which is a language model, that thing has, you can read it off here, that has some, that has, uh, like, I think 200 billion parameters, 200 billion parameters. Okay, so now you say, oh, okay, that, and that, and that, the size for the leading systems is doubling every eight months or so. So, um, by the way, <laughs> when you project outward, a human has the like your brain uh, is characterized by something like 100 trillion model parameters. Uh, Cardiac probably more than that a little bit, <laughs> but no. It um, so we uh, the uh, the average adult human has something like uh, 10 to the 14 model parameters um, that describe probably somehow how they uh, how he or she thinks right it's uh, the model parameters describe the connectivity of the brain um and it's interesting to note that to boot up a human being to be fully sort of you know uh like uh you know adult uh there's roughly like 20 years of experience input output experimentation with physics where you look at babies and all that stuff so the energy to train a human to boot up a human <laughs> I calculated it's about 190,000 kilowatt hours, assuming normal diet, okay, like 1,600 calories per day. Yeah. Um, and uh, but in G for GPT-3, it takes uh, so for GPT-3, it takes. Um, oh, sorry, I did that wrong. My bad. The energy that's that's the energy to train GPT-3, and this is. The energy to train a human to uh, to boot up a human is about uh, twenty times less. Okay, but a human is much more capable than the like, GPT three, and so um, there's a huge disconnect. And there's like discoveries to be made of seeing how how biological brains are able to learn with such you know so effectively with little amount of information. Um, and uh, and so we don't yet know that. So luckily, in that sense, I maybe mean, if, if you want some comfort that like AI isn't going to take everything over, I think it's that uh, we don't know the, the AI people don't know every they don't know how to train uh, AI systems with little amount of data, and there's still open questions. 
Uh, but in terms of just sheer complexity, we're like it's, it would be surprising if this line here of modern AI system didn't soon intersect the size of a you know of a human and just model parameters. But with that comes the question of how much energy do you need to do inference? Okay, if every one of those max takes uh, let's say a picojoule of energy, and if you and if you think about running one uh, model through, if you have a if you have um, like roughly one trillion parameters, as as GPT three does, GPT four will have more than that, as, as my understanding. Um, then each value will be used at least once, and in reality many times because of convolutional layers, they use weights multiple times. Okay, and so that would mean like if you're so just um, if you run inference once with GPT-3, it costs you, uh, let's say, about maybe uh, so more, more than a joule of energy already. And this is exponentially increasing. So you need to bring down the multiply accumulate uh, energy a lot and probably also latency if you unless you want to. Well, yeah, if you want to build bigger AI, which let's say it supposes that we do. OK, so what? how do the uh, the electronic circuits people do that? There's like. This is a big you know, topic, of course, in, in, in electronic circuits. And there's uh, two papers in particular that are uh, really quite nice in sort of seeing where, where the, how the energy and compute breaks down, uh, energy latency, things like that. Here's one from Mark Horowitz. And then this one is a very nice review uh, from, a, from a colleague of mine uh, uh, from her group, uh, Vivian Z, um, uh, with another colleague, uh, uh, Joel Emma. We actually started working with them. They do electronic circuits uh, for vision, uh, for AI vision in particular. We started working with them to see how optical systems can compare or how these other analog systems that we're building can compare. But one thing is the key lessons, the key problems there are, it takes more energy to fetch, it takes more energy to fetch uh, information over longer distances in memory. So um, one of the key bottlenecks is that under the von Neumann architecture of computing, you have a processor that takes input and it takes, like in this case, weights, and it brings them onto the CPU. It yeah, does the multiply accumulate. It can do products like in digital form, and then it spits out and writes it to another memory. So there's a lot of movement of information. And this information, a lot of the time, doesn't have to be moved like that the size of the uh, the size of the model uh, is again it's huge like maybe a trillion parameters so but you use it over and over again it's the same damn thing over and over again so since you reuse these values you shouldn't have to bring them out from DRAM into the processor ideally you would have them local you would have them sit there and that's what the this is why there's a lot of excitement of something called in-memory computing Okay, so then you bring the memory that is stationary, which is the weights, you, you bring that in and co-integrate it with the processors. Okay, so, and that's the idea behind like, uh, all, this is the main uh, principle behind uh, uh, these uh, specialty processors uh, by NVIDIA and Google and so on, uh, tensor processing units that do, um, that have the memory and the, uh, that, that they co-integrate things. Yeah. Caching. Right. Uh, yeah. So caching, you you have some amount of memory nearby. You just need to have a lot more memory, um, and dispersed. Uh, if you do multi-core processing, you need to have it uh, dispersed through uh, with with the uh, uh, compute cores, right? And uh, and ideally, a non-volatile like cache is a volatile, non-volatile storage. Um, so so. Uh, yeah, so in memory compute uh, the and um and uh and um a uh, uh and 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 if you and, and a related uh, approach to that is, is something called uh this is the systolic array architecture this is optimized for doing multiply accumulate for mo really for matrix matrix manipulation so here what you have is uh, a matrix input matrix a uh multiply that needs to be multiplied by input matrix B. What happens is that these values, the top row of A goes through these uh, step by step gets passed on through these different cells. And in every cell, you take the input value A11 and you multiply it by B11. Then you move 
A11, then, then you move, take the, that product and advance it to the next cell where you take uh, A11 and multiply it by B12, add it to the previous and so on. So, and in, in this process, you, you add all of the, uh, sorry, you take A12 and you add it to the previous partial sum. And so, um, so every cell here does this multiply accumulate of the input values as they stream in A11 multiplied by B11 multiplies, adds to a local register, and then you'd move to A12, multiply it by B21, okay, add that to the register and so on. So the partial sums all get added, okay? So this is the output, this computes matrix, the matrix C, that is the product of A and B. And this is the uh, architecture that minimize, that sort of, um, if you have to stream in uh, the data, uh, does a very good job of reducing data movement because data only has to move from cell to cell on the same processor. The problem there is that if you have bigger compute models that don't fit into this um, stolic array on one chip, you have to still communicate a lot of bandwidth, high bandwidth, you have a lot of high bandwidth communication between chips. So when you look at uh, the uh, systems that are specifically made for um, big inference or big training tasks, like anybody might know, like uh, Tesla's Dojo supercompute system, there you have uh, these compute cells with very high bandwidth interconnects to other compute cells, okay? So really trying to solve, to get at uh, reducing the overhead and putting these processes as close as possible because the, uh, the, the transmission of data here is expensive. Um, but uh, yeah, so this systolic array architecture is actually is what's uh, at the core of the uh, Tesla's, uh, uh, sorry, Google's TPU, and you can actually have access to it uh, on, on the cloud. Um, and, uh, and it's just one, of, one example of many um, that, uh, that use this kind of an architecture. But nonetheless, despite all these optimizations, the chips are still dominated by data movement cost and not just the raw processing. The raw processing, the amount of energy needed for just multiplying two D-bit numbers is relatively small. Uh, two D-bit numbers require of the order of D squared gates. Uh, if you just do the carryover and stuff like this, and um, and the energy consumption per gate per transistor use is small. Transistors are becoming smaller, therefore the energy like needed to charge the capacitor is small. So that's not really the the bottleneck. The bottleneck is the movement of data. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so. So that's why uh, really with this team of people here, we've started to look at how can physics, how can these analog systems, uh, can they actually help uh, uh, improve things? And, uh, and so at the core of our approach uh, are different photonic systems. Shown here is one, this is a photonic integrated circuit uh, made in silicon, similar to the ones that we developed that I showed earlier in the talk for connecting quantum memories, but here made in silicon photonics, you see a top view here, uh, there are photonic circuits, waveguides in silicon surrounded by silicon dioxide that uh, trans that, that guide light, and uh, this whole thing is actually a tiling of uh, this thing here on the on the on the top right, which is a Maxena interferometer. Okay, so you have one beam splitter. In this case, it's made of a directional coupler. Same thing essentially, and then there are multiple phase shifters. You need at least two to realize an arbit. You need three to realize an arbitrary SU two rotation on the block sphere. Um, but uh, leaving aside uh, global phases, you need two degrees of freedom. And so, um, and then we just, this is like, if you want, if you, if you like SU2 uh, algebra because you're into spin one half systems, this is basically implementing that for, for a photon. Uh, and then we, we tile many of these behind one another so that we can represent arbitrary SUN rotations. Uh, looked at a different way, this whole thing here can be represented as a matrix that takes some input values encoded into the amplitudes of the light, multiplies it by this matrix, and spits out the product of the input values of this of this uh, vector here times the matrix that represents this mesh. And um, and so here's the key. Okay, the input here is that can be one uh, vector on which we want to perform inference, for example. And uh, these uh, and this mesh here can be we can program that optically. Okay, so here you have in-memory compute because the like light is passing through stationarily, like locally stored values that represent the matrix. And 
as it, when light comes out the other side, you've got mul the multiplication of the weight times this, this u would represent the weight times the input vector x. Um, and the reason why this is this gives you an advantage is basically you can look at it in the following way. If you want to multiply an m an n by n matrix by a one by n column vector, digital electronics, uh, it requires of the order of n squared processor steps. Why? Uh, one way to see it is um, every element of the n square matrix is used once and has to be multiplied by a weight value at least once, oftentimes more than that. But here, because the matrix, the n squared values are stored in phases and light simply has to pass through to quote unquote compute, it gets done for free. So the number of operations for this kind of an optical processing step goes this order n. You have to encode n values, digital to analog conversion. The n input values have to be encoded, okay? But you, you, you do an amount of compute that's equivalent for a digital computer to be n squared of order n squared. So the argument is that if n becomes large, you could derive some substantial like savings and energy and so on. Yeah, question. And it's kind of a philosophical question about it. Usually, we think of there having there having been progress from analog computing to digital computing, and now it seems like we're going back in time to analog. So, how do you reconcile? Hold on to that thought. Yeah, I totally agree. Yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Great question. Okay, but that's first the order of magnitude calculation. And yes. Yes. You. Oh, uh, no questions are mundane, but. <laughs> Where do you work? Like, where? How are you storing the information? Yeah, this the information here is stored uh, in this case um, by the phase shift in uh, the silicon in this case waveguide, and um, and the phase shift here is actually done uh, realized thermally. So you'll say, ah, oh, wait a second, you're actually using I'm actually using energy to store to maintain those weights, and it's true. Yeah, so so you you change the temperature. We run some current through a resistor. To change the temperature a little bit in this case. How long? How long does it stay at that temperature? Yeah, so we have to constantly supply power, right? So it's about a milliwatt on the average per phase shifter, or one to ten milliwatts per phase shifter. But B, but A, a um, it turns out that that in the overall energy budget doesn't add so much. But B, we have ways of doing this in a non-volatile way. So you could really like it's a non-volatile storage of the information locally. Okay. Um, I guess maybe I can say one thing to this very good question that you, that uh, that you raised. Um, the difference, so w w why this compute method I think uh, can be viable, is that uh, we can work with relatively small, with relatively imprecise numbers. We don't have to do like double floating point encoding. We can get away with only eight bits, and you can do so. Then, like you can do analog encoding uh, or multi-level encoding of eight bits is actually okay. If you try to do many more bits, then the energy needed to encode it actually grows quite, quite substantially per bit. And so, but there's a sweet spot where perhaps biology also doesn't, you know, the neuron values in our brain also don't store information to the 32 bit. Um, they're, they're somehow biology has figured out how to compute with relatively small number of resolvable levels, but, but more than two. Okay, it has to do with energy because the biological brain evolved uh, under an energy constraint. So it's actually there's a it's a different it's a slightly different optimization problem. So, so the piezoelectric option, like you said, you wouldn't need this kind of. Right? That's right. Piezoelectric, you don't need it, and there are other methods like phase changing materials where you don't need that. Exactly. Yeah. This is all. Very, yep. Um, just a quick question. Not just uh, to there, no. <laughs> that those would be the bottom one would be a unitary matrix. Yeah. In general, the weights aren't unitary. Great. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, yes. So indeed, uh, normally the the values are not. Unit. You can embed an arbitrary matrix into a unitary. A unitary is a matrix that uh, conserves power. So, you know, but you can uh, take a subset of the unitary and uh, make that arbitrary. Yeah. How bigger does the matrix have to be for it to become? Uh, marginally bigger. Yeah. Marginally bigger. Yeah. Like like you uh, a couple of extra. Uh, basically, just pad it. You have to pad it. And and this this thing actually led to some companies MIT, uh, out of MIT Light Matter and Light Intelligence are actually on a, on a mission now to to take on the uh, you know big companies to take this on. Uh, so this is one way of using physics for computing. Let me show you a second way uh, that to me is actually it's more scalable. Uh, this one is like will be somehow seem super easy. 
to people uh, who do a lot of optics. When you when you think about a uh, coherent receiver as it's used in a, in a telecom industry uh, or as it's used in a laboratory, like you you have a you have a local oscillator normally and you have a signal. You put them on a beam splitter, two photodetectors afterwards, difference detector, difference current is generated, and that gives you the like the dot product of the local oscillator ELO times the E signal, right? Let's let me replace that terminology with X1 and W J1. What what a coherent receiver does, it takes the product between the amplitudes of these two fields. So if you modulate your local oscillator in homodyne detection, you actually perform the you 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 generate the do something useful you do useful computation you compute the product of two values and then fortunately if you just integrate in time as a photodetector does on the on the um, accumulator of the photodetector or capacitor or something afterwards you also does accumulate you do you do multiply and accumulate <laughs> so homodyne detection can be used to perform multiply accumulate by the physics of it and it's actually pretty sweet. It's super fast. Uh, you can do a homo you can do that, multiply, accumulate as fast as the data comes in. I mean, as provided that it's you can do this at 100 terabit terahertz bandwidth. And the energy consumption is tiny because it's really the electrons that are now in the photo detection process, a quantum process. It's the it's that the basic photo detection actually does your accumulate multiply accumulate. So you can do multiply accumulate um, between you can do uh, you can take vector you can take a dot product between two vectors ultra fast and with virtually no power consumption. Um, and so that's the other physics way. There's, there's other ways that people are you know looking at, uh, but these are just two examples of using physics to do computing. Uh, that offer very substantial advantages compared to the standard digital computing. Actually, when we looked at that paper, when we looked at that scheme theoretically, we computed here the energy consumption for optical deep neural network with an error rate that is equivalent uh, to an electronic traditional computer. Um, and so this is the energy per multiply accumulate. Uh, and again, you have that benefit. The bigger the 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 number, like the bigger the matrices become, the greater your advantage grows. This is also an n squared over n advantage. And here's um, what we predicted back then. Uh, this is, for example, uh, using today's technology, telecom technology. Suppose you made an optical computer out of telecom technology. Uh, or here is okay. Suppose we use technology that's represented, that's reported in in, manus in papers on like the energy of a uh, photo detector in the laboratory and so on, and make a system out of that. And you see that in all these cases, eventually for very large model systems, we predicted that the energy per multiply accumulate would fall below the so-called Landauer bound. Uh, this, is a, this is a thermodynamic limit. Um, if you, the Landauer bound as applied to a digital computer, so what it's saying is that these kind of optical computers or hybrid optical electrical computers could do computation at a energy consumption not achievable by the traditional compute architecture, even by thermodynamic arguments. And that for us was a motivation. Okay, let's see if we can build that thing. <laughs> okay, so this is what I wanna show you. Uh, and then this very good question here about, haven't we done this before? <laughs> uh, analog computing. Yes, we have tried and failed. Well. I wouldn't say failed. Actually, this one is pretty cool. Uh, this is the one of the first like useful computers that happened to have been analog. Uh, this is uh, the continuous intergraph. And standing over there is Vannevar Bush, uh, who published this paper. And actually, it was very interesting. In the abstract of that paper from 1927, um, it talks about things that are reminiscent of what people talk about nowadays with these quantum computers, the noise intermediate scale quantum computers, people always talk about uh, sort of like uh, heuristic is like, is it good at doing certain things? Uh, and, and how large of a thing can it do? Very similar here, it says um, the machine is like, it does the integral of product of two functions. Errors of the machine have been reduced uh, to an average of 1% for common uses. So this was experimental. <laughs> he was like trying it, they were trying it on different uh, problems like tide prediction that actually 
turned out to be useful for. And for those for that depth of problem, it was actually useful because the error rate was sufficiently low. But of course, digital computers came and uh, you know, and this kind of fell by the wayside. But uh, the reason why I think uh, optical compute or just uh, analog computing is still useful and interesting is because we nowadays there's certain like we know there's an existence proof that sort of uh, many level encodings with noisy encoding that's not digital is useful and it's that's us right it's biology um, there's an existence proof so we don't know how to best get there there's also uh, ways of I think uh, correcting the hardware so it turns out in optics uh, we have uh, we've actually studied this problem at great depth and we looked at um, can we error correct hardware coming from the factory for example always with some errors every hardware thing is a little bit different than another but it turns out um, you can you have if you build the architecture right you can actually feed back on the hardware to make the optical transformations perfect to the extent that you can measure them and so we we actually have a series of papers here is one um, and here is another uh, to actually go through that and what we see is that the machine which in this case is these optical circuits they are as good as you can measure and feedback um, and it's ultimately limited by the lasers and not the the hardware it's the lasers that are actually setting the bound ultimately and the reason for us if you have an error you can coherently cancel the error so um, so I, uh, I I like I encourage you and I'm happy to talk about this but I think this time it, it if you we can get make it as I think we can make the optics as good as the lasers and the feedback are rather than the, the chip itself and happy to talk about it offline I put a couple of references here but it's an excellent question right um, okay now I in the last couple of minutes I, I want to uh, advance through some slides quickly and show you like one recent result that's uh, that sort of brings some of these things together into an actual full system uh, experiment actually uh, let me let me two one other one through quickly uh, and I'm happy to talk about it offline. And then the other one, I'll go through a little bit more detail. The first one is, I showed you these two architectures of compute, right? I showed you one where you have this programmable circuit, sent light through it, and uh, like it computes and, and so on. That's only one mm, multiply accumulate for one layer. If you wanna make a system, then you have to have, have to take the output from this first uh, compute layer, take the output and send it through a nonlinear transformation doesn't really matter so much what it is. It has to be a nonlinear transformation and then send it to the next multiply through another matrix. If you didn't have the nonlinear thing in between, you could just multiply the two matrices into a new matrix called like C or something like this. And you could save yourself a lot of trouble. No, but you have to have one matrix, nonlinear function, another matrix, nonlinear function, so on. That's basically how these things are constructed. So to show that as a full system, we actually had to build a new chip um, in which we have the encoding of the problem then the multiply of the problem encoded here problem into the amplitudes of optical fields on a chip uh, then there is a there's a, a processor there's a chip here the programmable optical circuit just like the one i showed a moment ago this does the multiply of the input vector times the matrix that's encoded um, here on the on the phase shifters that gives you the the weighted average of the input this is x times u and then you have to send this through the nonlinearity uh which we had to invent and then it goes through until the end where the inference is done the thing that we had to invent is the nonlinearity to do that in a way that um a didn't need new materials to be developed uh because although we tried it's difficult and b um is sufficiently fast and slow the whole thing down the way we did this and here's the whole chip this is on the archive uh happy to talk about it offline but this kind of kind of like want to show you this one thing um the way to, that we made the nonlinearity happen is we have a um we have, we split up part of the input light. We have light coming in, you wanna apply a nonlinear function. We split up part of it using a directional tunable coupler that goes to a photo detector, which the photo detector output directly drives a modulator that then modulates the other light that's passing through. So here's the circuit diagram. Essentially, when you go through the math, you'll see that this is an engineered um, four wave mixing process. Um, so, uh, you um so you can and you can tune this nonlinearity. It's like a little like a nonlinear response in an in atom, perhaps, but um you you can uh so and then this has photo detection and then uh modulations. You'd say, ah, why is this 
what's so special, you could do this in another way. The key is to put the photo detection and the modulation really close together so that the photo detector does not have to drive a transmission line. That's what costs the energy. The photo detection itself is free. I mean, like the photo current is there. And this is like, you normally need a transimpedance impedance amplifier or something like this so that it can drive a load. But if the load is a capacitive load in the form of a modulator placed right adjacent to the photo detector, there is no, there's very little energy that it has to expend. There's no capacitance has to charge and so on. So if you take, and this is, we call that a receiverless photo detector, put the two things really close. And that, and that gave us, uh, uh, that was the key to make that work happen. Now in the last couple of minutes, I want to show, that's sort of like the, there's a lot more to that story as you can imagine. I'm happy to talk about it offline, but I want to show you the, uh, the second implementation. Uh, the second physics technique was to use coherent detection to do multiplication. Let's see how that can bear out uh, in practice. So here we wanted to do something that we want to take to take on something that's quite annoying to me. I don't know about you, but when you like ask, uh, in my case, Google Assistant, this is Siri, whatever, you ask a question, you're like, what time is it? You know, hey, hey, Google, what time is it? It's 1150. 7 what the hell? It took like <laughs> it took like 10 seconds <laughs> to respond. Why? Because it's like Google takes my voice recording, sends it to the cloud, it does inference there, it then sends it back and it gives the answer. The lag is a real bottleneck for applications. And this is called a delegated like cloud delegation. Okay, this is the, the standard in the industry. You do cloud delegation. Why doesn't she just run it? Why don't why, why don't we just run it on the thing? because it, it doesn't have the compute power. It's too low energy, it doesn't have the, you know, it doesn't have the compute power to do it. So um, it'd be nice if we got rid of this bottleneck. So here's how we do this in a, in a paper that just appeared uh, a, a couple of weeks ago here. So we have, um, the idea is that we have one uh, processor that, uh, that encodes the weights like in a language model from a server um, and then sends them out to a bunch of client devices on the so-called edge of the internet. The edge of the internet are like the things at the very, you know, that are like your home your, your, your router and th things that you interact with. That's the, on the edge. Um, and I illustrate a few of them here. And so then now imagine, remember the, like the, the scheme I showed a moment ago, uh, you have, you can locally do the multiplication of an input vector with another, which has the weights, with your local vector that you want to do inference on, by photo detection, coherent photo detection. So here, all the, the heavy lifting of retrieving the model and so on can be done by a server that's in the cloud, and it pushes that information to the local client. And the client can use this very efficient compute method to perform the, the, the matrix vector multiplication. That's the idea behind the paper. Um, and so then we actually demonstrated this in a in a in a in, a, in our Boston area network, uh, where we had MIT Lincoln Laboratory was playing the role of the server. They were sending data out over over the fiber to us here at uh, on campus, where we had a receiver. In this case, the receiver performs this kind of vector vector product uh, to you know to perform matrix vector multiplication on an inference that it wants to do some, in this case, we did image recognition. Okay, so here are, for example, the different weights encoding, you see that they're sort of semi-analog, they're eight bits, of, eight bits of analog precision. And then we have the input values. This here are the pixel values of an image. And then they get multiplied and accumulated to a register. And that does the multiply, that does the multiply accumulate, which again is the hardest thing uh, of the whole inference process. And then we see how well does this thing do? So we look at what's called a confusion matrix. This is, if I present, for example, uh, this is so this is digit recognition. If I present value one, what did you find? Um, and like, you want all these values here in the diagonal to be uh, perfect. This is the presented thing. And this is the inferred thing. You want, you want all these values we want. So what we see is that in our deployed fiber case, we were 98.7% accurate in, the, this particular image recognition task, which is indistinguishable from an actual computer. Okay, so we're as good as a computer in doing MNIST 
that of course is a small model there, so we have to make make it bigger, but it's a proof of concept. Um, but then the other thing, since I know that you that uh, this is a lot of like you're into noise accounting and so on, the interest so an important thing is that um, when you do when you when you do uh, Normally, when you do optical communications and you send one symbol and you receive one symbol, you say, okay, well, like you need to have a, the bit error rate must be very small on the received symbol. Um, and that means that actually, if you'd like say you, your bit error rate should be 10 to the minus typically it's, no, 10 or something like this, then the number of photons to exceed the shot noise limit has to be pretty big, like bigger than 20 or so. Um, but look, in this case, you're not sending one symbol and then reading it out. You're sending symbol and you're sending another symbol and so on and you accumulate over and over again over many transmissions and only at the end do you have to sample that value so you can photo accumulate a large number of products until you finally read it out and then the shot noise what matters is not the shot noise symbol by symbol but the shot noise of the aggregated of the aggregated sum okay so what that, that sounds like you're only going to gain like the square root. Square root. It's a square root advantage, exactly. So it, that, yeah, exactly. That's right. It's square root advantage, but it starts to matter when you have large vectors that you multiply. And in fact, just to jump to this here, like what we show here is this is the number of photons in the optical channel per multiply accumulate. And this is for a uh, for 100 symbol. This is like multiplying uh, vectors that are each 100 elements long. Um, and uh, and you can see here the uh, the optical energy per Mac for a system that has the same accuracy as a digital computer would receive in MNIST recognition. So you see here we get uh, you know something like the energy per multiply accumulated in the optical domain is about ten to the minus you know the six seven times ten to the minus seventeen. So about a hundred uh, photons transmitted uh, in. Um, in the uh, for this uh, for this non-local demonstration um, in each optical mode, um, and uh, and then when we did a local inference where we uh, where we just encoded and then received on this in the same laboratory, then we could get the number of photons per multiply accumulate to be of the order of one. I wanted my student to do a bigger model because uh, you know the. The, the the advantage grows the bigger the system is we haven't done it yet but um this is with a size 100 vector if you did a size uh a bigger vector vector multiplication then you can go substantially less than one photon per like symbol um and uh and you know so then only accounting at the the, the photon uh, energy um that's a huge win like the industry norm is about a picojoule per multiply accumulate, accounting only for the photonic part, and and um, that's a caveat that's important. Okay, and we um, we can talk about that more, like how we can maybe get something too close to this. But this thing here with the the data that you're looking at would be ten to the minus nineteen or so. So that's a uh, right a seven orders of magnitude difference. Okay, but to be fair, there's other things that you have to pay and so on. So there will be somewhere in between. Okay, but we're definitely motivated to make these systems, um, yeah, so uh, uh, larger, and so that you expect that to see that from us. So here's a uh, one other thing. Uh, this I will jump over, just but I, I put a reference here. You can the other thing that Optics gives you it gives you a tremendous amount of uh, information capacity in multimodal encoding. Like if you have an optical field, um, you know, like a, a millimeter square of area and one micron in depth uh, contains um, about a million optical modes, which each can have 10 terahertz of spectrum easily in the telecom. So that's a huge bandwidth. And, uh, and so the pipe and optics for information is vast. And uh, there's a, you know, there's different ways you could exploit that. In this paper, we do one where we use a series of, of, of um, spatial light modulators to perform multiply accumulate in this kind of spatially encoded uh, uh, architecture. And what we demonstrate here is that you can do, uh, you can basically do inference in single shot. You can like prepare a shot of a short burst of light that encodes some image and pass it through the system. 
uh, where which is an equivalent to sort of exascale uh, compute. I mean, it's, we can do about 20,000 max in, an, in a pulse that's 20 femtosecond long. Um, now the challenge is, but how do you do this over like more pulses? Or in this case, we could only do a very short pulse, send it through mode lock laser in this case, and then there was a lot of silence afterwards. Okay, so it's burst mode, but the the the, the you know the the capacity is there. You'd have to learn how to explode it, ex exploit it. And so one way would be to have like higher speed spatial light modulators that you can reprogram faster. And so that's motivated a lot of work for us, again, to close the loop sort of with what we're doing on the optical control of atomic systems side um, for both the AI thing and the and like controlling atoms, you need lots of channels. You need lots of optical channels that can be controlled with near analog or just high, very many like levels of precision. And so here's just three, uh, architectures that we've developed over the last couple of years, one based in uh, silicon nitride and oxide um, with Sandia National Laboratory uh, that makes use of piezoelectric tuners um, that can be actually but programmed at high speed over 100 megahertz. Here's a lithium nibate, thin film lithium nibate platform. This one, we have 16 channels uh, with 30 dB of contrast, each having 10 gigahertz of bandwidth. And the next one of this will be an order of magnitude larger. And here is a device based on silicon photonics where on that wafer, you have 10 billion modulators that are optically, in this case, optically controlled. This is doing the, the sort of like the photo detect and, and uh, photo detect and modulation technique. So it is basically capable of controlling very large numbers of optical and electronic channels. channels. But if you if you can do it, you could maybe help make uh, programmable quantum systems, but also maybe better for AI. So with that, I'll, I'll come to the end. Uh, it's been great to have some conversation along the way. Thank you all for the. Okay. Yes. How do this? Do I pick? Okay. Okay. I guess maybe. Yeah, since I have to ask about LiDAR bounds. So I could find our bound as a limit on the amount of work you have to perform or entropy you have to dissipate to erase one bit with and that's expected to hold a cross platform. Yeah. So how do we have one version for digital computing and one for optical? Right. Okay. Let me tell you how we accounted for it. Um indeed, uh it's for Non-reversible computing, you have to erase information, and that consumes KBT minimum of energy. Um, that's one way to say it. And then, uh, we in our case, we looked at uh, we have to multiply two 10-bit-ish uh, numbers. Uh, for a digital computer to multiply two 10 numbers, um, if you go through the, all the accounting, right, shift left, uh, and uh, like you know, left shifting when you multiply, the, and then you have to do all the, um, and then you have to uh, then you have to do the partial uh, sums. Um, it requires of the order of d squared operations. So d squared would be about a hundred operations, and then each, um, and then you have a bit of overhead. It turns out because of the memory shuffling, it's about for multiplying two. 10 bit numbers, your computer requires about a thousand gates. Okay. And then a thousand gates is, and each gate at a Landau limit would be 10 to the minus 21 or 22 ish joules, which is one fortieth of an electron volt. Yeah. So each like transistor. Yeah. Each uh, uh, logic gate. Um, and uh, so um, that's so, yeah. So if you account for this, then basically the Landau li limit for multiplying two 10 bit numbers is about 10 to the minus 19. Okay. Um, and so that's on a digital computer. If you do things in a binary, on a binary computer, uh, in our case, uh, we don't do it in the binary, uh, computer. In our case, we say like, we, we break the Landau bound of if they, we would compute at an energy below the Landauer bound limit for 
digital implementation of that computation. Um, we're not claiming that we break the lander bound per se, but we are for our digital computer to do the same compute, it would have to break the land error bound. That's what we're claiming. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, Jake. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So actually in the, um, in the scheme that I, so actually for both of the techniques that I discussed here, there is a, there exist proposals for speeding back propagation. And the idea indeed is that uh, you have to, you must compute uh, local, you must compute derivatives. If I wiggle this uh, number, uh, that weight value, how does it change my inference? And, um, and you can use uh, coherence of optical fields to compute that derivative simply by um, the fact that uh, like that uh, my, uh, a um, that a beam splitter operation on two fields performs the sum and addition of the fields absolute value squared allows you to to find the derivative um, and so you can show that for both the uh, both of the schemes that I showed here in fact uh, so, yeah, there's a uh, uh, published papers actually on both. One of us is one of them is our paper, uh, 2019 PRX. Um, the other one is from Shanghai Fans Group, um, and um, and we're like actively working on that. So, but it's a yeah. So it's a it's an excellent point. Uh, the the thing uh, the the training is just vastly more difficult still than the inference. And uh, sort of also scientifically, it's uh, in, in many ways, it's a, uh, you know, just don't, don't just like make it faster. You can actually discover new things. So we're, we're like, we're, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, research exploration. We're, we're, so like we're actually trying these uh, coherent uh, backpropagation techniques at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, two questions. Could you comment on how big the neural networks are that you're actually creating? And yeah. The other question is, is there a path to take this to 100 billion, 100 trillion, like size? Neural yeah. Networks? Okay. First question. Uh, so far, um, there's for proof of principle demonstrations with our student teams, uh, we've stayed with rather with, uh, more compact models, but um, it's definitely on our roadmap to go to larger systems. Uh, in the, I often get asked the question like, can you fit a much bigger model onto your photonic circuits and uh, basically they're you know your surface area limited um, so for the in-memory compute technique here uh, it's I would say it's yeah there's techniques but they're not like near term to do very large models like you know like we're at one trillion values although we can definitely do it holography is basically what <laughs> you know I'm like I, I've been reading a lot of papers on holography because it's fascinating uh, somehow it was dropped because people have learned how to do uh, you know, store in other ways, but holographic methods can store vast amount of data in a crystal, for example. Um, so that would be in principle a way that you could do that. So you can do a 3D version of this photonic chip, like if you can make holography work better, um, holographic storage work better. Um, so, but we don't have that in the near term. On the other side, the second technique where we do the systolic array analog, uh, where we feed the, the weight and the activation simultaneous there there's no limit how deep you go um, because it's just time accumulating and so uh there actually i have a detailed uh memo like i do these memos from a detailed memo that actually goes through and that's to your second question um we i think we can actually i think this technique allows you to do uh compute at a the number i derived is if you build a supercomputer out of this with less than one megawatt of power consumption you could achieve 10 to the 21 um, or 10 to the 22 operations per second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think so. This is I didn't really get to it, and know, there's the jury's still out. But I, there is there seems there's a lot of uh, commonality in the in like machine learning on the classical side and um, and 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 on the quantum side. And then quantum machine learning can mean many different like means different things to many different people. But like I we just one, one thing is uh, we actually looked at one scheme. Suppose that you do have the exact scheme that I showed earlier with light, light passing through this programmable interferometer, nonlinearity, and other parameter interferometer, and so on. And suppose that the nonlinearity was actually a reversible nonlinearity, that it was non-dissipative, that it was, a, for example, the um, like a nonlinearity expressed in an atom. Uh, in that case, we, we, we suppose here in this paper that that, that existed. And then you can look at this thing as a, this like series of interferometers as a programmable thing. What you're programming is interferometers. You don't program the nonlinearities. Those are fixed, but they are they are reversible. And actually, in that case, there's also a backpropagation technique that applies to that incidentally. And uh, we could train this like black box to recognize different quantum states, like we or to repair. We could actually learn error correct. If you don't learn an error correction, which is maybe interesting for for one way quantum repeaters. Um, so we could do that uh, in this paper. Okay, happy to talk about it off, offline. And and I can also say that if you look at that paper, you see that our the things that we could train this quantum computer to do required probably many more devices than necessary. It's clumsy. We didn't know how to program it well. So there's a lot of like if I give you a quantum machine and you ask like you ask it to perform something, how do you program the optimal process? You know, without having to do full process tomography. Uh, that's an open question, I think, but it's a very, very interesting one. So, if we put time to get a speaker, the, the session of TV, the speaker session at 4 p.m. of the JQR meeting room for students. So, I'll please come and do the session. And we've done the time for speaker. Oh, thank you.